Um, what I wanted to do is uh, to look at the past uh, 12, 15 years, um, first by pointing to some headlines regarding social change, and then um, trying to see if um, the um, kinds of um, conclusions that we can come to by looking at social change, will they imply anything in terms of politics? Um, I think most of what I say will be quite familiar, um, not too much new. Um, we can all agree that um, there has been um, a tremendous change in Turkish society over the last 12-15 uh, years. Um, but of course this was facilitated through um, AKP's um, rule, which was a single party rule and therefore quite uh, efficient in the sense that uh, there wasn't too much uh, time lost to um, party politics, to coalitions. But also it should be remembered that um, AKP was uh, building its policies um, on very good institutional background because after the 2001 crisis, um, we had, um, through the auspices of uh, the World Bank and Kemal Dervish, of course, um, a fairly good um, set of rules uh, that uh, rule that uh, governed the um, workings of, especially uh, the financial sector, and those helped quite a lot. Um, now, in terms of the achievements of this period, I think um, the following um, to me seem to be important. One is that, um, as we all know, um, until this period, the regional um, difference or the regional divergence, uh, the regional inequality between Istanbul and parts of the um, Western, uh, parts of Western Anatolia and the rest of Anatolia was uh, quite deep. Um, since, however, then, um, and we know this under various uh, rubrics, Anatolian bourgeoisie, the Anatolian tigers, etc., this regional uh, chasm between Istanbul and the West versus the rest of Anatolia has uh, somewhat been um, closed. That's, I think, a major uh, development. Another one is that, uh, related to this, uh, urbanization um, outside of Istanbul again, outside of the three or the four big cities, has been managed in a fairly efficacious manner in the sense that uh, cities are not um, the sort of, uh, ruins that they used to look like. Um, the infrastructure in the cities has been improved. Uh, transportation is incomparably better compared to what it was. A third point is uh, perhaps less visible. Um, the, if you look at the statistics, um, there have been uh, some um, decreases in uh, items and variables which uh, appeared to be uh, almost like destiny of uh, de underdeveloped countries like Turkey. Informal employment is much lower. Self-employed numbers proportions to the labor force are much lower. Unpaid family labor has also declined. These are important because they indicate that uh, the working population now is more formally uh, employed. Um, similarly, uh, of course, all this was happening through uh, a very rapid urbanization, although we have to be careful there because over the, uh, since uh, 2006 or so, uh, population in employed in agriculture as well as population in the countryside uh, have not been declining much, but this is, not a, this is not bad news because what is going on is a good and so a working balance has been struck between various sectors in the coastal areas, uh, tourism in particular, and the agricultural population. So there is a, sort of a new balance um, that seems to prevent the wide-scale migration out of the countryside. These are all um, aspects of uh, 
economic change, which might have happened in any case, just perhaps happened that perhaps occurred in a more rapid manner and uh, wasn't, uh, the, 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 the change wasn't managed uh, so badly either. But they also imply social change in uh, various forms. Uh, one of the uh, main things, of course, is along with the uh, repairing of this regional imbalance, there was also development um, outside of Istanbul of a new bourgeoisie that, again, uh, as I mentioned, that we call the Anatolian bourgeoisie uh, with very different codes of behavior compared to the old um, import substitution uh, sort of state um, um, under state tutelage bourgeoisie of Istanbul, that what we usually know as Tusiad. This is uh, this is something that, uh, of course, a lot of people have remarked on. They have written on it. Uh, the fact that there is this new um, sort of um, uh, locus of economic power with very different politics. And uh, we will see also, um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, in terms of um, their political, uh, exp and political expectations that we might have, uh, a very different sort of orientation. Partly as a result of this, the new industrial proletariat, the new uh, workers uh, in these Anatolian towns, are much less prone to or much less ready to contest the kind of capitalist development um, that we are now observing uh, compared to the old industrial proletariat that uh, we used to celebrate in the 1970s especially and partly in the 1980s. Um, now we don't really expect too much from the proletariat any longer. Uh, unionization is very low. Um, there hasn't been much industrial um, strife um, to speak of. Um, so uh, in a way, um, if there's going to be any sort of uh, progressive politics to be expected out of this social uh, transformation, uh, the proletariat probably is not where we should be looking at. By the way, this is not, of course, specific to Turkey. It's very similar in the rest of the world as well, um, the industrial proletariat, except in a few places like China, is not really very visible in the political horizon. Uh, but there is uh, another development which I will be uh, especially underlining. Both the growth of modern industry in, uh, outside of Istanbul, as well as, of course, in Istanbul, and the fact that uh, out of the entire employment, 50% now is in services, means that there is the development of a white collar, professional, educated stratum um, that uh, I will be talking about. I'll come back to it. Now, um, going back to what the government uh, did vis-a-vis uh, -vis these economic developments, I think one might, uh, we might all agree um, that uh, the most successful uh, policies of the government uh, over these last 12 years have been in social policy. Um, they were able to uh, transform Turkey's welfare regime from a conservative, what is in the literature called sort of corporatist regime, uh, which used to apply only to um, a few um, components of the working class, a few components of the population, uh, left out a lot of um, uh, the population uh, because, they were, because the welfare regime was ba based entirely on formal employment. There was also much difference in terms of um, how the welfare regime was applied to different sorts of workers the state functionaries as opposed to uh, workers in the private sector, for instance. These uh, were all overhauled um, for in favor of a universalist, redistributive, citizenship-based uh, welfare regime, which is fairly successful. There are two principal components of it. One is um, the uh, social assistance in many forms, um, there are um, monthly stipends given to the elderly, to the disabled. There is, of course, conditional cash, trans uh, conditional cash uh, transfers. In other words, 
uh, basically poverty assistance um, conditional on uh, attendance at um, in, in schools or, or, or uh, for babies uh, uh, medical um, uh, examinations uh, every six months or so there's housing there's all kinds of child support and in-kind aid um, the second uh, component of this uh, welfare regime is, of course, the health reform. Uh, the health care reform, the health transformation project. And uh, this has been successful, uh, more so than uh, the uh, Obama reform, for instance, in the US. Um, it's near universal. Um, there's no more division uh, among, um, for instance, SSK people versus uh, uh, versus functionaries, state functionaries. Uh, of course, this has been at the expense of providers. The doctors are not very happy about it. Uh, hospitals are not too happy about it. Uh, there has been a squeeze in terms of what's expected of the health providers. But uh, for the uh, people who are beneficiaries, they seem to be extremely happy. Um, this was uh, proven again and again in elections, uh, in the polls. Uh, uh, content, uh, the, the, the fact that people were so, so happy, uh, contented with the new health uh, reform uh, seemed to be a factor in uh, the popularity of the governing party. Uh, in terms of social assistance, there's one figure that uh, I also was not aware of and it's really uh, impressed me. For the bottom 40% of families in terms of income, uh, distribution, social assistance uh, made up 20% of their income. Now this is especially true in Kurdish areas um, and it's especially true for the uh, what we might call sub um, Kurds who now live in cities such as the Arbakur and very many other cities in the region um, who have no uh, real work um, and their entire income comes from seasonal migration in agriculture. Um, they are, I think, without exception, mostly they all receive some kind of uh, poverty, uh, as, uh, poor assistance. Um, and I think, uh, again, uh, with, the Kurd with the Kurdish areas especially, uh, these programs have been uh, quite effective in terms of uh, containing um, discontent. Um, all these programs end up, and uh, this figure was much less than uh, two-thirds of this. Uh, now, I think the figure is something like 15% of national income goes to social assistance, social policies in general. Now, I want to come back to um, the middle class, which uh, I had mentioned. Um, as you might know, uh, nowadays everybody's interested in the middle class. I mean, uh, you look at any publication and people are talking about uh, middle class rising, so many millions of people, there's all kinds of ways of calculating who the middle class are. Um, but most of these um, are interested in the are business publications. They're interested in the um, middle class in terms of its consumption potential. So this is why um, they talk about um, discretionary spending, they talk about uh, those people whose daily income is between $10 and $20 or $5 and $15, whatever, however they choose to uh, define it. And we know that this is uh, this kind of middle class um, sort of with, uh, based on the consumption potential or the consumption likelihood. Um, is in fact quite prominent, uh, quite visible in Turkey um, because you know, we have these uh, chain stores that sell electronics and we have shopping malls. Almost everywhere you go in Anatolia you see them. The number of cars that are sold every year is almost up to one million. Housing you see everywhere again all over, not simply in Istanbul, wherever you go. There's uh, in the periphery of the old cities you have the high rises, which um, are supposed to be uh, purchased by the new middle class. So, in fact, th in, from that point of view, there is a middle class. But the problem is, 
course, this particular definition is not uh, very uh, useful because it is about uh, a, a very heterogeneous group of people. People who have a certain um, consumption potential can come from anywhere. They, they can be uh, employers, they can be self-employed, they can be salaried, they can be, they can be sort of uh, the old middle class who uh, were lucky in some uh, enterprise. I think in order to gauge the political potential of this group, we have to define it a bit more narrowly. And this is how uh, it is done in, really in, in, in sociology. And um, the political potential is confined not to the middle class defined so broadly, but more narrowly uh, to those who have uh, some education in the form usually of university graduation. And their occupational position is one which requires them to perform in some educated manner. In other words, they have to be selling some expertise, some professional um, aptitude. Um, you, we've been hearing about these people um, um, in conjunction with recent political movements. Just to remind you, for instance, in Thailand, uh, people talk about the middle class rebelling against the, uh, what they think to be a populist government. Similarly, in Venezuela, the um, um, riots against uh, Chavez and his successor uh, have been, of course, all these kinds of people, the uh, educated professionals. In India, we have heard about anti-corruption movements, which again are usually attributed to this kind of middle class. In the beginnings of Arab Spring, uh, we heard about um, um, the um, similarly white collar, educated, English speaking uh, students and, of course, professionals who were in the Maidan. And, of course, in Turkey, um, this has been one of the um, uh, discussions uh, among social scientists whether, in fact, Gezi uh, events were instigated by this same group. Um, this uh, suggests, of course, that uh, this new middle class is, uh, uh, in terms of, sort of, uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, identify any political potential in this uh, transformation, in the social transformation, the new middle class seems to be a key, and um, perhaps one should look at it a bit more closely. Um, how does one look at it more closely? Well, I think education is perhaps the most important component of the definitional sort of uh, matrix. And if we look at uh, education, we see really uh, a quite uh, stupendous change in terms of number of people who graduated, who now attend university, etc. Um, gross scholarization in, in the tertiary education and university, open university, and what is called early science, or basically two-year colleges, vocational colleges. It's gone up from 22% in 2000 to 75% about two years ago. This is gross. In other words, it's not the, it's not the number of people who are in that age group divided into the total age group, but it's all university attendance divided into the age group. Um, the, the first figure actually is 40%. Um, now, we know that university attendance has been stagnating in the developed countries. Uh, if you look at the statistics, um, um, US is sort of floundering, but in most of Europe, uh, university attendance is not increasing. That has to do somewhat with uh, the age structure, the demographic structure. But um, the university uh, attendance uh, increases are now seen in what we might call emerging markets. Um, Turkey obviously is one of those, uh, but also in places like Brazil, India, of course China, China is up there. Um, so um, now Turkey has more students in university at any time uh, than Italy, UK, Spain, or France. Uh, this is an incredible figure. Um, now, of course, I know the rea immediate reaction is, yes, but what are they doing in the university? Are these real universities, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, of course, you're right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, of course you're right, uh, but uh, and 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 you know the, the 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 answer has to be yes. But the experience of being in the university itself is something. Uh, I think that's uh, sort of easy to agree with. Um, now. Not all jobs that uh, these people who get out of universities uh, have to take, of course, are commensurate with what they learned. Um, that is true, uh, but uh, OECD uh, um, has an annual publication called Education at a Glass, and there it seems that uh, whatever, on, on, I don't know exactly on what they base their figures, but uh, it seems like Turkey is not in such bad shape. In other words, everywhere in the world, people coming out of university are not able to find jobs that are, that are commensurate with what they have, uh, what they wanted to find. Um, now, of course, uh, one thing that uh, one should uh, add to this is um, the sectors that the new middle class are found are also sectors where women's employment is uh, very uh, prominent. Now, again, uh, if you look at women's uh, employment, there is a, a very steady increase uh, in terms of uh, labor force participation of women. As you know, it was uh, very, very low until uh, something like 2005, 2006. Um, and then since then, there has been a steady increase. Uh, if, you, if you are at all interested, you mustn't look at total figures. You must look at the figures of women's labor force participation in cities because agricultural labor force participation doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's impossible to think of women not doing anything in, you know, if they are in agriculture. But in the cities, uh, the figures have increased uh, quite rapidly. Um, now we're talking about five and a half million women who work in the cities, and what well, that's not I mean that's not something to remember, but thirty five percent of these women have university degrees. So the more women come out of universities, the more this figure will be going up. Um, so okay, since I have only three minutes, I have to switch. Um, so where does the political potential of this new middle class come from? Well, because um, I mean, just a, a few sort of uh, headings, um, because they have a stake in rationality, in the sense that you know they come out of universities and they have learned things and they have an expertise, and one would expect, therefore, that they would be averse to um, the kinds of things that we would associate with more sort of oriental ways of oriental. <laughs> Uh, ways of uh, behavior, patronage, partisanship, arbitrary rule, etc. Right? So that's one thing that might lead us to uh, expect that they would be at all times for meritocracy. And meritocracy is a very progressive thing. I mean, in the sense that uh, it might become something that will mobilize people in politics. Their education, secondly, is of course much less parochial um, in the sense that um, they will be uh, closer to building transnational networks, not only for purposes of business, but also in terms of consumption patterns, lifestyles. Think of all the, uh, all the uh, programs and all the uh, shops and all the uh, cites that have English names. Um, these aren't presumably uh, addressed to people who have no links with national global networks or no links with the language. Uh, um, I, one more thing, uh, because they are relatively poor in incomes, in other words, their economic capital is, uh, is, is, is not uh, uh, too, uh, too impressive. Um, they'll be more willing to uh, and more careful to defend conditions of existence of their distinct privileges. In other words, um, they would be closer to, for instance, coming, uh, going on the streets for uh, the environment, for the uh, protection of public space. Um, they care more about uh, culture, etc. So these are these markers of particular. Um, style of life, these markers of particular lifestyles, um, they would be willing to uh, fight for. Now, uh, 
Similarly, I think again, uh, you know, since their entire capital is education, they're also much worried about what happens to their children in terms of their in terms of the children's educational potentials. So, uh, once again, to, to just to go back to this, uh, I mean, Thailand, Venezuela, they were against populist leaders. India and China, they were against corruption. Um, they were against anti. They were against authoritarianism. Uh, these things all came up, of course, in Gezi as well. Uh, in all these movements, uh, women as well were remarked to be uh, participating quite heavily. So the question then is, given their structural position, can the new middle class perform an important political role to strengthen or initiate culturally libertarian, modernist, and anti-authoritarian movements? Um, so this is why I think that um, if we are going to be looking at potentials for political uh, mobilization, one important segment of the population, that is really the result of the transformation that I, had to, I want to describe, uh, will be this new middle class. Now, can I have two more minutes or three? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the rest of this you know because <laughs> Because, I mean, this is obviously too simplistic. <laughs> we can't really look at uh, sort of political potential simply by looking at uh, social change and uh, the uh, formation of new groups in the, in the, through social transformation. Because um, uh, class politics unfolds within uh, concrete contexts. And this, these concrete contexts in the case of Turkey have to do with all the things that you know, identity politics in the form of uh, religion, in the form of uh, cultural codes, in the form of resentment uh, against uh, the old elite. And uh, these, of course, all complicate things. Um, but I don't want to go into that now, because both because you probably know all this, and also perhaps in the Q&A we can talk about it. 